They're on the screen. Shortly, I'll be turning the agenda over to Ms. Sarah Johnson, our solicitor. We'll talk about the hearing duly constituted. I will then discuss the project history. You will hear from Mr. Jamie Lynch, our project manager. We'll discuss the project options that are being considered. And then you will hear from Mr. David Trader, our architect on the project, who will be describing the project itself. And then we will discuss the financing of the project, which will be led by Mr. Scott Shearer. At that point, public comment will be available for interested residents. Ms. Johnson? Thank you. Can we start with roll call, please? Teresa Brown. Tara Connor Halston. Here. Susan Hunsinger Hoff. Here. Maggie Kistner. Here. DJ Schultz. Here. Aaron Stroop. Here. Aaron Whalen. Here. Jennifer Wilson. Here. Dave Brown. Here. Nine board members present. Act 34 of 1973 requires that a public hearing be held on all new construction and substantial additions for second, third, and fourth class school districts. Act 34 applies only to costs for new construction and does not address the cost for alterations to existing structures. In addition, there are other excludable costs which are not factored into the Act 34 calculations, including site development costs, test borings, and architectural and engineering fees on these items. A second Act 34 hearing is required if specified costs based on bids exceed by 8% or greater than the uh, costs based on the estimates. An Act 34 referendum must be held if and only if certain costs exceed a project building's calculated referendum limit. The purpose of tonight's Act 34 hearing are as follows. To establish the need for the project by reviewing historical events leading to the board's decision to proceed with the building program. To review the various options considered by the board prior to their decision to proceed with the project. To describe the construction to occur at the new Keith Valley Middle School and District Administration building project and the educational program that serves as a basis for what is being proposed. To present the estimated construction cost, the total project cost, the financial needs, and an estimate of the local tax impact of the project. And to give citizens and residents the opportunity to comment and to pose questions. This is an opportunity for the administration and the professionals who are accountable to the Board of School Directors to describe and discuss the proposed project. It is not a debate, but a stenographer is present here to receive and record comments and observations. The official record of the hearing is being documented in order for the board to consider and study constructive comments or questions. Please feel welcome to participate during the comment period at the latter part of tonight's presentation. There are sign-in sheets available at the back of the auditorium. After the testimony, we will call upon individuals who sign such sign-in sheets in the order which they appear. Commentary will be limited to three minutes per person. Residents and employees of the school district may also submit written testimony regarding the proposed projects no later than 4 p.m. on Friday, May 4th, 2022. Such written testimony should be mailed or hand-delivered to Bill Stone, the board secretary, the Hatboro Horsham School District, at 229 Meeting House Road, Horsham, Pennsylvania, 19044. The written testimony shall include the name and address of the person submitting the request, identification of the sender as a res district resident or employee, the name of the project, and a description of the support or objection in the pro to the project. To be the most benefit of the board, a statement of objection should be followed by a viable alternate solution. On February 22nd, 2022, the board passed a resolution fixing tonight's hearing and establishing the total project cost at $110,545,950 and the Act 34 maximum building construction cost at $84,908,383. At this time, I will mark the Act 34 booklet as Exhibit 1 and submit it into evidence. 
The Act 34 booklet includes the aforementioned resolution from February 22, 2022, as well as the certificate by Bill Stone regarding advertising requirements, the notice of the public hearing, which was posted, and a notarized copy of the advertisement of the Act 34 hearing that ran in the Intelligencer newspaper. We have four witnesses tonight, Dr. Scott Evslog, David Schrader, James Lynch, and Scott Shearer. Gentlemen, if you can all stand and be sworn at this time. With that, our first witness, Dr. Scott Evslog. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I'll be talking about the need for the project and the project history. This has been over 10 years in the making. The district has been discussing facilities and specifically Keith Valley Middle School uh, as, late as, two, as early as 2008. Given the condition of the Keith Valley Middle School, the district engaged the Viteta Group to do a facility assessment of the Keith Valley Middle School building that was completed in 2008. There were several deficiencies that were noted. Some notes about the project, I mean about the building itself, excuse me. It was built in 1957. There were additions and renovations to the building in 1963, 1969, and 1994-95. And no comprehensive renovations have been done since it was originally constructed, which has been 65 years ago. It was noted in the facility assessment that there were significant system upgrades that were required, including aging boilers, energy inefficient lighting, and unit ventilators, and no air conditioning. Building envelope issues, including the window and roof, and ADA accessibility modifications were noted to, needed to bring the facility up to current standards and codes. Anticipating the need to do construction, the Pennsylvania Department of Education mandates that a school district engage in a district-wide facility study to analyze the district's existing building stock and consider options for improvement district-wide. The Opera Horsham School District engaged an architectural firm to prepare a comprehensive feasibility study of all of the, of the entire district and all its facilities. This was completed in March 2011. The study analyzed current and projected enrollments, building capacities, and the physical condition of each building. The outcome of the study presented potential enrollment and capacity issues and identified that several elementary schools and the middle school were in need of renovations or replacement due to age and physical condition. Simultaneously to this, the Horsham Land Redevelopment Authority was created to examine the possibilities for land on the Willow Grove Air Base. In a 2012, the Willow Grove Base development, Redevelopment Plan allocated 40 acres to the district for Keith Valley Middle School to be uh, built right in the center, center of town and near the base. Unfortunately, also in 2012, that base redevelopment uh, was delayed uh, and we have been in that somewhat of a holding pattern since in the district. So knowing that was not a possibility, the district looked at other options for other buildings that were identified in the feasibility study. The BRAC, which is the base realignment enclosure property located uh, currently where the current Hallow Elementary site is, uh, became available and allowed the district to prioritize Hallowell Elementary School as the first project to be undertaken. That project was a replacement school on the Bragg property for Hallowell Elementary, which was completed and opened in 2017. At that point, with the base site still not available for redevelopment, the district proceeded with the design of Crooked Billet Elementary School as a replacement school on the existing site. This chain of events was noted at the Hallowell and Crooked Billet Elementary School Act 34 hearings. With the completion of the Crooked Billet Elementary School in 2020 and the development of the base site continuing to be in question, 
The options to address Keith Valley Middle School were narrowed, and the considerations were narrowed to the uh, building the, the new facility on the existing middle school site. The existing building systems in Keith Valley Middle School had reached their useful end. The current middle school does not support the district's educational vision for collaborative and project-based learning for middle school age students. And this was exacerbated by pandemic conditions, which magnified the need to provide flexible spaces, maximize outdoor teaching and learning opportunities, and to provide new building systems with greater ventilation and airflow capabilities. Also on the site of Keith Valley Middle School on Meeting House Road is the District Administration Building. Located on the same site, that facility is also aging and has failing systems. It does not accommodate the, the space that's needed for district offices. We have um, modular offices on that site, and we have district um, administrators located in buildings throughout the district. It does not accommodate the space needs that we, that we need, in addition to be having ADA challenges and facility failing as well. Both human resources and curriculum are the departments located in the adjacent annex, the modular, modular construction. So you will see in the plans the inclusion of the district administration building in the site itself. Also in the site, you'll see the district pool Currently, the school district is a pool located at Simmons Elementary. It supports both the community programs and the high school programs. It's currently a six-lane pool. Uh, we are at the point where an eight-lane pool would be uh, optimal for the needs of the, of the district and the community. Um, that pool itself is in need of significant repair and with uh, HVAC, roof, and lighting are all in need of replacement there. So if that, if that facility were to remain, there would be significant investment in that as well. There also is no ADA access to the spectator seating on the mezzanine level at the pool. At this point, I will turn it over to Mr. Lynch, who will discuss the project options considered. Good evening, thank you, Dr. Eveslage. Um, yes, I'll touch briefly on project options considered for Keith Valley uh, Middle School and start with the next slide. As Dr. Eveslage mentioned, the first option for the new middle school was actually the location identified on the Willow Grove Air Base. Um, uh, that was the uh, site that was really defined by the community as a, a great new site for the middle school. And it's been unfortunate over the years that <clears throat> that site has not come available. That was really the first choice, the first option for the new middle school. Uh, in light of the fact that the site on the base was not available, the district had to take a look at uh, renovating uh, on site. Obviously, another site in the district would be A, hard to come by, and two, also incur additional costs as far as acquisition goes for the district. And so, renovation and additions was really the focus of the Viteta study back in 2008 and uh, in all of the examinations that have occurred uh, since. And essentially, and uh, simply st stated, um, building-wide comprehensive renovations would be required to bring Keith Valley up to current code standards, ventilation standards, ADA standards, educational program standards, and, and also all other standards by which uh, uh, modern day school facilities are, are measured. <clears throat> Additions would be required to address program deficiencies in the existing building. We know that there are modulars uh, on site. They would be converted to bricks and mortar classrooms. And then the final component, and uh, it's really been magnified as a result of the pandemic, is that phased renovations in an occupied building would be disruptive for at least four more years of school. And uh, that's something uh, that the district took very seriously and did not want to undertake so that we would have dust, dirt, noise, and all of the wonderful things that construction brings with it to an occupied facility. The building itself um, is really uh, difficult to renovate in its condition. Floor-to-floor -floor elevations are difficult for HVAC upgrades. A complete new electrical system is required. New roofing, new windows, new HVAC, 
new structural system as, as well. We have several areas that have a crawl space under them and the structural steel in those locations has deteriorated to the point that wholesale replacement is required. And so as a result of all of the effort to take a look at the building, uh, it really justified uh, new construction on the same site. We also wanted to make sure that there'd be sufficient space on the campus to construct both the new building and the proposed uh, natatorium and the other systems and components to support the middle school. Um, again, it was really the opportunity to provide a new school design that supports the district's educational vision for next generation middle school that really complements the work that was done for the elementary schools at Hollowell and Crooked Billet. Um, smaller things that can be improved on the site include the site circulation for parent traffic, for bus traffic, for staff traffic, and to add parking to the site and to improve the athletic facilities on the campus. So all of these things are considered in helping make the decision for a new school project. Again, as far as maintaining at the current location, accommodations would not be achieved for space needs for administration and, and staff. As a part of the Keith Valley Middle School project, the district administration building is being moved into the new Keith Valley building. The existing administration building is comprised of an older building that is not ADA compliant and has some other deficiencies. And it also has modular trailer constructions that house some of the administrative offices. And so the decision was made rather than to renovate that building at substantial cost to move the district administration into the new middle school, which would provide certain economies of scale. Um, <clears throat> the district-wide data center is also housed in the existing district administration building, and the concept is to move it from its current uh, insufficient location into a well-ventilated, secure area inside of a new building, and then also bolster the capability of the broadband system uh, that the district provides and provides service to all of the school district's uh, uh, buildings, other buildings. So as far as relocation to the new Keith Valley Middle School, the district administration gets a new and more uh, space effective plan for its offices. The data center gets relocated to the new facility. And all of this is available under the Act 34 requirements put forth by the Department of Education. Other locations were identified and, and analyzed for the district administration office, including Pennypack Elementary School. The cost to renovate that building were too great in comparison to the cost of installing de the district admin in the new Keith Valley. Moving over to the Sil Simmons Elementary School would require an addition renovation on that site as well. The existing space that houses the current natatorium is insufficient for the space required for the district admin. And there is no space over at Hatboro Horsham High School if uh, a new addition was considered for district admin at that location, it would also be uh, an addition uh, in square footage to the building, but it would also require the reconfiguration of parking and some of the amenities that are on site. And so the new Keith Valley Middle School was identified as the, as the most cost effective location for district admin. A third component of the project is the new natatorium. And the options considered for the new natatorium included uh, maintaining, simply, the natatorium at Simmons Elementary, which is comprised of a six-lane pool uh, and uh, requires a good number of renovations in order to bring it up to current standards. Um, if it was maintained at a, as a six-lane pool, we'd need renovations to the locker room, to the pool system, to the pool shell, and also the addition of an elevator to provide ADA access to the second-story spectator uh, area. We also took a look at enlarging the existing six lane pool to eight lanes, which is more common for a school district natatorium. Uh, this would break out a piece of the building and also take away from a, a section of the uh, existing staff parking lot and also impact the parent drop off lane. And so when we took a look at the cost for this, it became quite an expensive proposition when compared to a new eight lane uh, pool. Uh, in putting the pool at Keith Valley, there's ample space for the eight-lane pool with diving. There's also the ability to provide supporting locker rooms, spectator seating, uh, and restroom space at Keith Valley. <laughs> 
One other option that we did look for at, um, uh, as far as the pool goes is to relocate the pool to the high school. And the same thing happens at the high school that happened with district admin. A large piece of real estate at the high school would have to be acquired, repurposed, there'd be construction there, parking would be jockeyed around. And so once again, the most cost effective and reasonable option, even though we'll have to transport athletes over to the middle school, was to build at the new middle school. So after all of these options, the selected option was to build the new Keith Valley Middle School on the existing site on Meeting House Road, incorporate the district admin building, and include the natatorium uh, at that site. That's the description of the options considered, and I think I'm gonna introduce Dave Schrader now, who's gonna give you a description of the project. Okay, hey, thank you, Jamie. David Schrader, and I'm representing the architecture and engineering team. Uh, my role here is to provide a project description and to show how that description fits within the Department of Education requirements. So you'll see a couple of Department of Education documents here. Uh, part of these follow all of the history that you've heard previously here. Um, and we've been working on the project in design for about 14 or 15 months, and that follows the time that the district put into the history, plus put into the um, educational design plan that went into this. So the first document uh, is one of the Department of Education requirements describing each existing facility and what its end result will, will be. And you see halfway down the sheet the existing Keith Valley Middle School with all of its parts and additions and renovations demolished as part of the new project. You also see the new Keith Valley Middle School in bold and District Administration and Operations Center. Uh, which is part of that facility, and you see the total acreage for the site of about 38 and a half acres once you've consolidated the two uh, building sites. So I'll talk about site plan, floor plans. You'll hear a little bit about a building that is estimated to be approximately 276,000 square feet. Uh, we'll share some views with you, and then all of the descriptions that show as plan con our planning and construction documents uh, developed by the Department of Education. So when you see reference to that, that's what it is talking about. The two things that I will talk about are two of the advertised costs. One is the plan con maximum project cost, which you saw in the advertisement and which was referenced earlier, and the same for the Act 34 maximum construction cost. We'll get into each of those. So the first image is the existing site plan. The upper right-hand corner I'll use drawing uh, right, is, is white, and that's the existing Keith Valley Middle School. There's a small box about two-thirds of the way across the site from right to left, and that uh, small box is the district administrative facility, and then you can make out the track on the left-hand side of the site. So part of the goal here was to work very carefully with the grades of the site, and to try to locate the new building so that the existing building could be occupied while the new one was being built. The goal then to move all of the students into the new facility once it's complete, and then once the existing building is, demol is, uh, is abandoned, then we can demolish it. So the white outline at the bottom of the site there identifies where the new building would go. And the next image is the proposed site plan. And this shows a number of other things that we're trying to achieve on site. As mentioned earlier, one of our primary goals is to always separate the car and the bus traffic. So the top of the drawing going left to right is Meeting House Road. And if you start on the right-hand side of the site, which is identified in the brighter green, that is the bus entry point. And the buses will come in from Meeting House Road there. Um, circulate around that circle area and then park kind of in a herringbone form where all of the students will be led into the building from the bus entry. And I'll share that with you in the next image. The driveway that's about two thirds of the way across the property on Meeting House Road is the parent drop off. And part of the advantage of where the building is located, besides the fact that it allows us to construct it while the existing one is occupied, is it allows us a very long queuing line for the parent drop-off area. So you can see how that loop enters from Meeting House and takes some pretty good distance 
uh, before it reaches the building and then circles around. The lower left-hand corner is meant to be staff parking so that that gray area that you see is occupied mostly by the district um, staff for the building, but also the district administrative folks who will enter from that lower left-hand corner of the building. And again, you'll see this in a site plan in a second. The track and football field will be in a similar location to where they're currently located. Uh, just below those, you see four tennis courts. And then on the upper right-hand corner, once the existing building is gone, you see four playing fields with the opportunity for a fifth in the outfield of the baseball field. Uh, the last thing I'll draw your attention to is there is a roadway that seems to run from left to right at the bottom of the site and then loops up and connects with that bus driveway. The right-hand side of that is the service drive, and so you'll see that there will be service vehicles that will come down uh, deliveries and so on that'll come down the bus driveway and loop around just the radius portion of the driveway. From that point across the bottom of the white part identified as the building, that will be gated off and will be only used for emergency access uh, should there be need for a fire access or something like that across the bottom of the site. So the balance of the time, there will be no vehicle circulation through there. The last thing that I'd identify in this site plan is the amount of landscaping along the bottom of the site, and that is intended to provide as much buffer as possible for the neighbors adjoining the site. So this is the floor plan for the building, the ground floor plan, and it is aligned the same direction as the site plan was. Along the bottom you see four wings that drop uh, from the main part of the building in blue. Those are three-story structures of classrooms, and it's basically four team groups of uh, three floors each for the classrooms for the students. The middle in the green and the orange are the dining spaces and the library, and then the purple is the auditorium. So there will be three main entries. Uh, the upper part that I identified earlier in the site plan will be the bus and athletic entry, and that's from a story up from where you are in the plan here. The secure entry that folks like myself would come to uh, and be let in adjacent to the main office area is that middle uh, triangle, and we enter into the gray secure vestibule. And if I were coming to the district administrative entry, I'd enter on the left-hand side from that parking lot and circulate up to the second floor of that blue area, and that will be district administration. The next floor up allows for uh, access to all of the athletic events at night. And so part of our goal for the building was to have all of the community spaces, meaning the auditorium, gym, and, and pool, towards Meeting House Road, and the quiet areas being the classroom areas towards the back with this large central space that I'll share in some uh, videos in a second here. The upper right-hand corner is the pool. The left hand from the pool is the main gymnasium, and then there are support and auxiliary gymnasiums in orange just below that. To the left on, this, on the plan in the lighter blue is the district administration on the second floor from that entry identified on the first floor. And then this is the third floor, and this is essentially just the third floor of classroom wings. Um, there's an open area into the central space of the building, and I'll share that again in video shortly. So there's the first floor plan in um, kind of, we call it an axon view. It's a cutoff view, and I'm going to use that plus the second and third floor just to give you a couple of video renditions of how the facility will look. So the first one is circling down from the site plan, and what this will do is give you a sense of the scale of the building on the site, and it'll start to show some of the circulation patterns. The first circulation pattern that you're going to see is the parent drop-off from Meeting House Road, and that comes to the main entry point. The second is the service access point down that loop road that I described. And then the third is the bus drop-off, which comes off of Meeting House Road also. 
So you're seeing the site now for Meeting House Road across the playing fields. Um, and on the right hand side is the parent drop off and the left is the bus drop off. So you would approach the building and the building is set down into the hillside here. So it takes advantage of the upper and lower tiers of the site. And we're working our way up past the football field and the track and the tennis courts to the main entry point. And this will be both the parent drop-off loop and a secure entry point for visitors. Uh, the second floor of the area on the right of the building is the district administrative entry, and you can see the main entry point that you would enter as you came to the building. This is just going to circle around the building. The building is composed of brick at the base level for durability. And the second floor and second and third floors of the academic wing are fiber cement panel product to try to tone down the scale of the building a little bit. The windows all look into the classroom courtyards and the intent there so they're not actually overlooking any of the neighbors, rather they look inward. And then you see a few of the developed courtyards as you circle around. Each of the courtyards has a, a small theme to it, so this one just happens to be outside the art and STEM areas. And finally, when you come around the side of this, you can see that the service area is tucked in between the last classroom wing and the pool so that any deliveries are hidden from uh, the neighbors as well. And it'll finally come around the pool area from the exterior, then it will go past the gym and then finally to the bus access point, which comes in on the second floor of the building. So that's the bus access point there. Um, I'm gonna do two or three more videos here. I think I'll start at the center of the building and we're trying to make every space as flexible as possible. And so one of the things that you'll see is that the auditorium is designed to be a smaller 400-seat uh, auditorium for tra traditional performance. And there's a folding partition that comes across the back of the space to make it that 400-person uh, performance space with a full stage. Um, there's what we call a learning stair at the back side of that space. And when the folding partition is open, you can open this entire area up so that the entire student body can be seated in that area. So now you're moving out from the auditorium, fully acoustically treated, uh, to that learning stairs and kind of to the center of the building. This is the entire commons to the building. And the concept steps down from higher ed concepts that you may have seen and this space is both an academic and a social space. Um, you'll ascend the learning stairs here to the second floor, and you'll eventually come over and be able to overlook the dining space, and then ultimately the Learning Resource Center, otherwise known as the library of the building. On your right-hand side are all of the classroom wings, and if you're staring straight ahead, you're looking at the athletic areas of the building. So there's the dining, and the cafeteria uh, service area for the facility. And you can see how this works in the evening as well. It allows you to use all of these venues, uh, both having a performance and then having food service for the performance if that were part of the, um, the concept. So this is a view of some of those central teaming spaces for some of those educational concepts that were talked about earlier. And this will rotate up that entry point right there, that almost bridge-like structure, is the entry point that the students all come in from, from the bus entry. And they'll walk directly across that to the middle level of any of those classroom structures and either go up or down only one floor in the building. 
That side of the building that you're seeing in the video now is the library commons, and it has around it all of the science, technology, and engineering spaces. And I think the last video I might do here is of the athletic areas. And so you're seeing the auxiliary gymnasium on the right, which is a, a full-size gym, but also the, the middle school competition gym here with pull-out bleachers on one side. And then as Mr. Lynch referenced earlier, the pool is designed into this facility as well. So that's the last space that we go through. So there's the eight-lane pool with spectator seating on the side and all of the systems to run the pool as well. So back to the Department of Education forms after the design of the facility. Um, a couple of factors here from a numbers standpoint. The first Department of Education form shows a compilation of all the construction and design costs for the project. And in that case, you're seeing a number just under $97 million here, which is important because to get to the Act 34 number, you subtract all of the site costs from that. And that's a number that I'll share with you in a moment here. Uh, as referenced earlier, the total project costs with financing were the $110,545,950. And that includes the project financing and all of the soft costs. So that's what that uh, document shows. These are the site costs, which you subtract from the, the building costs to get to your Act 34 cost, and that's what this document represents. So there's the advertised Act 34 construction cost of just shy of $85 million. There's a stipulation on that document that if the building construction cost only is 8% in excess of that, or if it reaches 91,701,000, then a second Act 34 hearing would be required. So we're required to tell you that this evening. The second um, kind of test for costs in a Department of Education project is a check for, to, to guarantee that you have not exceed what they call the aggregate building expenditure standard, which is a maximum threshold allowed in the state uh, for a project of this size. The capacities that you see in no way should be interpreted as the capacities for the building. These are tools that the documents use to try to arrive at that cost that I just referenced. So that's what these two documents do. Again, do not reference these for total capacity for the building. But those numbers go into a worksheet that is identified here, and what they reference is something called the aggregate building expenditure standard of $101,363,120. If you exceeded that, you would be required to hold a referendum. In this case, as we mentioned before, the Act 34 building construction cost is that number that's just shy of 85 million. So you have excessive capacity uh, in this project to build the project, essentially. That's what these documents are showing. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Scott Shearer to describe how the financing alternatives are handled. All right, well, thank you. Good evening again. Scott Shear with PFM Financial Advisors. So I'll be reviewing section six. So you heard about the need and the history and the overall options and then the, the great project description. Now our job, one of our jobs as the district's financial advisor is to look at the ways to fund this project. So here are four different options that uh, school districts typically look at. And again, the four that we analyzed here for, for this project. Uh, three of those involve a type of financing, and the other one involves basically using cash or some sort of short-term loan. So again, uh, number one there was cash. Number two was general obligation bond issue, which is a long-term uh, bond issue. Number three, local authority issue, again, another long-term bond issue. And then the last one, uh, a long-term bond issue issued through the State Public School Building Authority. So as we analyzed those four different options, I kind of did a high-level analysis and, and summary on this page, and then we'll get to the next page that shows some of the numbers. Basically, when we looked at option number one, which was the cash, um, 
or you know, accumulating cash flow over a certain amount of years to fund a project. We found that that was not feasible given the, the size and the timing of the project. So then we focused on the different financing options. So there, when we lined up the three different financing options, we looked at upfront issuance cost, ongoing cost, um, the type of bond issue that would need to be issued, such as a revenue bond or general obligation bond issue, and those have different interest rates. So that would impact um, the analysis as well and their prepayment features. So when we basically put everything side by side, um, the general obligation bond issue uh, proved to have the lowest interest rates, the lowest upfront cost, the most favorable uh, refunding provisions, as well as keeping local control here with uh, the school board. And you can see some of that analysis on this page here where we lined up the three financing options uh, on the right-hand side. And kind of when you get down towards the bottom where you see the average annual payment, uh, the general obligation bond issue was a bit lower than the other two financing options. So as we were uh, putting together our different schedules and different alternatives of funding, you know, we looked at ways that um, could maybe reduce debt service. So num number one, the district has a very, very good credit rating. So that's obviously, obviously to your advantage that um, will garner lower interest rates than some of your peers, many of your peers um, out there. Because of the good credit rating, you will not more than likely need to buy bond insurance, which is a savings of an uh, upfront cost. Um, because of the uh, structure of the district's debt portfolio that's been well managed over the years by the district administration and the board, we are able to use what's called a wraparound structure where we're able to defer some of the principal until your other existing debt pays off and that allows for a lower budget impact. And then the third point here, we're looking at phasing in the financings basically through five different, uh, five different pieces or five different components spread over the next couple years and you can see the very size of the bond issues, you know, basically 10 million um, for the first one, about 28 million for the next financing, about 29 million for the third, another 21 million financing for the fourth issue, and then another cleanup issue for the fifth issue of about $10 million, and that will then fully, fully fund the project. Um, we do not anticipate receiving any state reimbursement uh, on this project due to the PlanCom moratorium, so we did kind of factor that into to our analyses. And then in addition to sort of the bricks and mortar costs that you've been hearing about, there's also other indirect um, costs that are reasonably expected to be incurred uh, with this project. And those costs come at a total of about $77,000, which are made up of those three components. In the middle of the page, you got support personnel of about 49,000, additional custodial supplies of about $2,500, and additional insurance premium of around $25,000, which again gets you to the total um, annual impact of about $77,000. Based on the current value of a collected mill for the school district of about $2.5 million, that translates into 0 .003 mill equivalent to cover those indirect costs. So then when you factor the indirect cost on top of the financings that we previously went over and the millage impact uh, or the millage equivalency of those uh, respective financings, we're then looking at um, 1.275 mils for the direct cost, plus then the 0 0.003 millage equivalent for the indirect gets us to a millage impact of about 1.278 mils. The rest of uh, this section just kind of has the backup of the schedules. Um, you know, these backup schedules, you know, again, feed into the prior pages and show the millage impact basically over one or two years. However, with other options that are available to the district, um, more than likely that millage impact will be phased in over a much longer period of time, maybe seven or eight years, uh, with some other mechanisms that, uh, that we have. So with that, I will turn it back to your solicitor. Thank you. That concludes the testimony, and now is the time for public comment. I will call your, you up in the order of the sign-in. Please state your name and residence of, of, and municipality of residence. Your comments are limited to three minutes. 
Our first speaker is Mary Lou Stitt. My name is Mary Lou Stitt. I live at 214 Garden Avenue, Horsham, Pennsylvania. I was born in 1957, and I graduated from Hampshire Christian School District in 1963 to 1975. When I attended what you call Key Valley Middle School, it was the high school, 9 through 12. You say about the partitions and multi-level stairs. Well, why don't you use the thing, the, uh, pull the uh, shades over to make it three separate classrooms like they did when I was in school? Diver you know, I know. Ms. Stick, can you speak into the mic, please? Oh, sorry about that. There is no, I read the uh, readings from the variants here. There's no way you can enforce that parking with the mothers and the teachers. And Upland Avenue, it was put, put out on the final agreement in the variants or zoning board. It said that when and if you determine there's a problem on Upland Avenue, it then you will do a traffic study. That was not what we wanted. You need to know that Upland Avenue is kind of, um, will be deeply impacted, and so will I be on Garden Avenue. It's no longer quite neighborhood that I would have to worry about my grandson going out and play. You're making it that way, because mothers and families would do, I'll go around and try to cheat. Second law. You say 1957. My question is, I'm looking over this budget. You built Hollowell and Crooked Bill. But why? I see nothing on there about maintaining the new buildings. You're prideful about Hollowell School. Well, where is their fire lane going all the way around it? Because they have the garage, the school bus garage next to them. We're a block away from the fire company. We need that road. Now, I, re I realize with the plant zoning committee putting forth your efforts that we basically lost. And I do not have $100,000 to lay down and protest on this. However, I've lived in that house except for five years. I am 65 this year. So for five different years, I was in that house. I live in now. My father built that house. Why don't you then put the school, the classrooms facing the park? There's nothing wrong with that. Just flip it around and put it in the park. And before you say anything about the dirt and all that kind of stuff and the mess and the dust, I know that for a fact. Even though you're doing this modular construction, you're still going to have dust and dirt all over the place. My father was a carpenter. He built that house on 214 Garden Avenue. Through the years, we had to help clean the units and stuff. No matter how much you keep it clean, while you're doing construction, there is still going to be dirt and dust all over the place, no matter what you say your ventilation system is. Now, I have automatically assumed when you gave the estimate 85 million to get to school and to bring it up to code, Thank you that for your put, comments, Mr. Stitt. Well, I'll finish with this. All right, Thank your you heating your system time. said you're going to upgrade, right? I would automatically assume that if you did that, you put the air conditioning in. All I hear about is oh, no air conditioning. What about the quality of teachers? Mr. Stitt, your time is up. Thank you. Next, we have Carl Young. And if I can remind our speakers, we have a stenographer here that is writing down what you're saying. So if you could speak slowly and into the microphone, that would help her. I'm try, but I do have a speech impairment, so bear with me. My name is Carl Young, 214 Garden. Yeah, the microphone is better. Thank you. My name is Carl Young, 214 Garden Avenue in Horsham. My plain problem is, yes, uh, no, um, I should say, uh, traffic uh, preparation was done on Upland, on me house, and traffic was going to get worse. And my uh, main concern is fit the building around so the classrooms would not face the houses. My third main concern is you're talking about the budget. By figuring everything in into the, uh, into the budget, including the bonds. Well. Talking about mills and stuff about raising the taxes to help cover the school costs. You said to us 
The bond will cover everything. Now you're talking about raising our taxes, you know, to help cover this cost of the school. Now, I'm main point out to you that some of us, house owners, or elderly, my sister, that's done speaking, is on SSD, disability. I'm retired with disability. Well, although we're house owners, we have fixed income and these high raising our taxes, not uh, left and right, is uh, hard on us. We raise our taxes and almost one retirement check. How many plus we pay our bills and the mortgage on the house and uh, each month, and one month paycheck had to go to our taxes, especially for the school, because you raised them to have coverage at the school. It's not fair to us and the house owners. For on, on disability. You haven't considered that in the consideration, the reason the school's taxes to have covered the school. You said the bond will cover everything. Now I just hear 1.2 mil, or 8 mils to help cover the school. That means our taxes will go up because you didn't uh, factor in every uh, cent, in every factor. Thank you. That's what I'm upset about, mostly. Thank you, Mr. Young. Next, we have Catherine Kenny. Hi, my name's Catherine Kenny. I reside at 252 Garden Avenue in Horsham. I'm opposed to the building of a new middle school. Inflation rate is at a 40-year high. That means almost 8% uh, inflation right now. It is not the time to build a new school, nor to consider this project. Your estimated costs have not increased, be it with the inflation has increased. In my opinion, it's going to be $9 million more million that we're going to have to do, and that's not including financing, and financing is going to go up. I would like to really see this whole project be put before the vote for the entire community to vote on in a general election. I think that's the only fair way to say that this is a cost efficient or something that the community really wants and not an I need, I want project. You, the school board, have not maintained the middle school, in my opinion. As of 10 years ago, the plan was to build a new school, so you neglected to take care of the current middle school. It is a waste of my tax dollars to not have maintained that. Have you or will you already have decided that you are going to do the same to Simmons and to this high school and that you will neglect to take care of these schools as well so that you can say that you need to have a new school? I did not go through the Happer Horsham Middle School, school District. I went to Archbishop Wood. That school is only five years younger than yours, and yet it's been maintained. They have done technology advances. When I went to that school, I was impressed. I'm not impressed with the way that you have not maintained our schools. Shame on you. The middle school, uh, right, and again, I say it's a matter of I need versus want. What we do need, though, is to improve our school system and what is happening inside our schools. Provide a safe environment for our children can learn. Improve the quality of our education and by doing that, then we improve our outcomes and our standing in the state. We have really dropped in our standing in the state. And if you think a new school is going to do that, I tend to disagree. I may not be an educator, but I do believe that we need more than a new school. The school board has many, the school has many internal problems which need to be addressed and adhered to. These Goals of a new school will not address these issues of poor performance, bullying, and fighting in these schools. Increasing technology will not increase performance. As the kids today say, why learn? I can Google it. So if you increase their technology, that's what they're going to do. They're not interested in learning. They just want technology, and that's what you're going to give them. Um, so from my point of view and from what it said, on the school board had outside uh, the middle school in the fall said, it's not the building, it's what's inside that counts. I think you need to change what's inside, not the building. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kenny. Next is Ann Sheely.
Hi, Ann Sheely, owner of 250 Garden Avenue. The purpose of this building is to educate our students. I oppose the requested project cost for the construction of this new building due to the impact of the burden on the community with the increased expenses and due to supply chain issues. Substantial justice has not been fully addressed regarding the impairment of the properties. Additional traffic will be more likely to continue. Just the problem will be moved from Arundel to Milton, Garden, and Upland. The location of this building is a huge impact on the surrounding community. Do we need a new school? Potentially. Does it need to be located where you want to put it? No. It can have the same purpose closer to Meeting House Road. We could make, I know this meeting is not for making adjustments to the current school and renovations, but that is something that really should be considered again with the supply chain issues out there. And moving it to protect our students closer to Meeting House Road. The proximity to our homes, moving it from 600 feet where it currently sits to 100 feet from property lines. The homes on Arundel were built with the school in its current location. Those homeowners knew what they were getting themselves into. Um, with power lines came to the back of their homes. They knew there would be noise from students and activities. Mr. Schrader told us tonight that making the building more pleasing to the neighbors. But the fact is, you can't hide a building of this size and magnitude with shrubbery. And he talked about inward uh, windows. Well, what about the windows in the um, insets? Those windows are going to be looking on the, the homeowners in their backyards, doing whatever they are all day long. You're putting it too close to those neighbors. Additionally, we have concerns for the safety of students having play fields in front of the school on the main road instead of behind the school. The safety of the students being dropped off on side streets since the property is not, since the building is going to be more centrally located and not closer to Meeting House Road. And safety of the walkers coming onto the property from Meeting House Road and Upland. Safety of our students having to cross parking lots and busings to get to playing fields. And here's one that it's a snow drifts. Where the property is currently located, the topography of the property um, hasn't been an issue with snowdrifts because the long driveway is now becoming blocked. There's a concern that the front of the building and the safety escapes in the back of the building will become blocked by snowdrifts. The winds cause tremendous drifts on this property, which has not been an issue for students as the school sits high. But now a new building consuming over three and a half acres and fit three and a half acres and 15 acres of impervious surfaces, putting it 100 feet from the property lines. This is not in line with the Horsham Township's 2005 green fields, green Thank towns, you, open space plan. Please take that into consideration as well. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to give public comment this evening? Seeing none. Mr. Stone, were there any written comments submitted by the noon deadline today? No, there were not. There's a reminder that written comments may be submitted to Mr. Stone as previously outlined prior to 4 p.m. on May 4th of this year. If we have any written comments um, submitted, that will be included and submitted into the record. With that, that concludes the Act 34 hearing.